welcome to Films and Stuff with your hosts, Pete Mitchell and Ethan Hunt. Pete, welcome back. How are you today? I'm good, Ethan. How are you? Okay. I am great and I am very comfortable in my chair because I know that we've got a long session today and a lot to talk about. This is going to be a doozy. It's going to be a doozy. And that's because we're going to talk about the Mission Impossible, I guess what do you call it, anthology film series? Yeah, that's it's right got word. so many in there that it's got an anthology is probably good. It's it's yeah. a lot of movies. Yeah. I it's mean, almost uh, approaching Fast and the Furious levels of movies. <laughs> I was just going to say, apart from Fast and Furious... Is there any movie franchise? I don't I don't think like Marvel counts because that's so many different things, but is there any movie franchise other than Fast and Furious that has as many films? James in Bond, it? which this is very much a Maybe James Bond, yeah. This is the this is clearly the American take on the spy genre, which I think James Bond was the let's say the prototype or the predecessor of and i think mission impossible has gone in a very similar vein but has focused on the action element of it yeah right a little bit on the espionage don't get me wrong there's there's still quite a fair bit of espionage with um the the mission impossible series i think in fact i would go so far as to say both series have influenced each other I think if you look at the James Bond series, you know, of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Right. And even the early 2000s. Right. And then the Mission Impossible series. I think now, like with the Daniel, uh, Daniel Craig remake of or reboot of the James Bond franchise, that's also got relatively good levels of espionage in it, but is also been kind of predominantly yeah. known for its yeah. action sequences, right? Whereas Fast and Furious is all about Fast and Furious is all about action sequences. Family and action and mm-hmm. Corona. That's it. Yeah. All three, yeah. right? Corona yeah. beers, uh not Corona the virus. Corona beers, <laughs> fast cars, beautiful women, and family. That's really all that it, that yeah. franchise has. It's it's uh, don't get me wrong, I, it is a very shallow series, but I love it. Yeah. Um, and Mission Impossible, uh, sorry, and James Bond, I think was initially all about the gadgets and then became a little bit more about the, like, a little bit about espionage and the plots. And I think Mission Impossible started out more about the plots, almost no gadgetry, and now has kind of become a mix of gadget reaction and then a little bit about saving the world. So can you believe... The first Fast and Furious was in 2001, but the first Mission Impossible was 1996. Yeah. Yeah. And I, in 19, I, that's crazy to me. Yeah. Right? I stand by the fact that I think Mission Impossible 1 is still my favorite one. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I loved most of them. I wasn't a huge fan of Mission Impossible 2, but I think Mission yeah. Impossible 1. For me, because I grew up watching the the remake of the Mission Impossible series. So remember the television Mission shows, Impossible, the, the television TV shows. shows. Right. Yeah. So the television shows had two iterations, right? Or not two iterations, but at least the second half of the iteration was a little bit more modern and more gadgety. Mm. That's the the version that I watched the most of. And then That's why I really liked Mission Impossible 1, the 96 one, because it was really a spy thriller kind of movie. And it wasn't, there were gadgets in there. There was definitely a few gadgets in there. There were a few action sequences. And of course, the most famous, one of the most famous, if not the most famous Mission Impossible pose. Still. 25, 30 years later, still stands the, the most iconic image of Tom Cruise hanging off of two wires suspended in an all white room, trying to steal information from a computer. Right. Yep. I I think I, so I agree with you. I think that's even to this day, the most iconic scene or image 
But for me, and I agree, that first Mission Impossible, which was Mission colon Impossible, that first Mission Impossible was, as you're right, it was really about intrigue and the, uh, you know, the double agents and who was working with who. For me, I think if I'd watched that movie again, it would not stand the test of time because I remember there being a lot of email. And I remember it was like AOL email. Yeah. And I think that I think that, that would not age well. But the 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 deception part, you know, the the mission in Prague, uh, I think that aged very well. And and that's part of the intrigue that I think in the most recent installments has not really been there as much. I think what Mission Impossible did, the first one did, was that a lot of the others definitely didn't do, although they started doing again, mm-hmm. was they said our audiences are smart. Mm-hmm. They didn't think that we were dummies watching the show, right? Or watching the movie. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have to explain things or in outright fashion. And the best example I always think of was in Mission Impossible 2, there's a scene where Tandy Newton has to steal a disk drive from the main bad guy while they're at the horse racing track. And he's carrying it originally in his left jacket pocket inside. Mm -hmm. And she needs to steal it from him Give it to Ethan or give it to the team, get it copied, and then put it back before he notices, right? (laughs) And she does that, and she was like, yes, I've taken it from his left jacket pocket. And then everyone reiterates, yes, it was in his left jacket pocket. (laughs) And then he mentions, oh, yes, you can take the drive. It's in my right jacket pocket, which means, of course, he knew she had taken it from him. And put it in the wrong jacket pocket, right? But like, you didn't need to show, you didn't need to tell us explicitly that she messed up. Yeah. Right? But what they did was, they hounded on that fact. It's like, oh yes, it was in my left jacket pocket. Now it's in my right jacket pocket. Like, okay, we're not idiots. We get it. She messed up. You know, we know that you know that she's a a double agent. Move on. Right? Yeah. Give us a little bit of credit. You know, we're not all idiots. You're right. But I was, whereas in the first one, and I get it, people were confused. They didn't fully understand. And maybe, you know, some of them are dummies. But I like that they didn't. <laughs> I, I, I like that they were saying, hey, this is a spy movie. If you can't keep up, you have to do pay, yeah. pay attention. So That's in it. 1996, would you have ever imagined that in... Uh, 30 years, right? In 30 years or 28 years, you'd be on episode number eight. Cause that's, that's what we're looking at, right? Is in, is in 2024, we're supposed to have MI8. 20, or oh, is it 24? Okay. Uh, I, I'm reading different things, but I mean, do we even have a date for MI7 yet? It's going to be the end of 2022. Is that right? I don't know. So, yeah. again, the pandemic kind of ruined everything in the sense yeah. that it was supposed to be that 7 and 8 were filmed back to back, which led me to believe yeah. that 7 and 8 – It well, okay. So, it said two things about that. One, it potentially said that 7 and 8 were going to be direct sequels of each other and were going to be related to each other. Mm-hmm. And two, more importantly, it also said to me that, hey, Tom Cruise isn't a spring chicken anymore. You can't have him jumping off of buildings indefinitely for the rest of his life. Yeah. Right? So let's get the maximum we can out of him while he's still whatever age he is. <laughs> because when we want to film Mission Impossible 9 and he's 65 years old and needs a, a cane to walk around because he's broken his hip, that's not going to work. I mean, you're not exaggerating, though, because he's 57 right now, right? Right. I mean, he's 57 in the year 2023. We haven't even seen 7 and 8 come out. So if they're going to film a 9, I mean, it would not come out until he is 60, 61. Yeah, so so that's the, you know, it... 
look, he is clearly he made a deal with the devil because he doesn't look like he's older than 40. He's still and God bless young. him for that deal. Yeah. yeah? I, mean, I mean, he yeah. is at 57. It's somehow every time he's on screen, it somehow still looks like he's in the prime of his life, which is crazy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But <clears throat> again, good for him. But, you know, at some point, it's going to start looking comical to see a 60-year-old man or a 70-year-old man or whatever he's going to be yeah. doing the kinds of things that he's doing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, so let's go through the anthology because for me, I'm really looking forward to MI7. I'm looking forward to MI8. I need more information about what these are about. But to be honest, it's been so long. Number six was called MI Fallout. Right, and this is 2018. Okay, I, I've yeah. just lost. I've just lost track of the first six. So, do you think we can just take a minute and kind of like summarize where we've gone, and then we can make some observations about this franchise? Yeah, yeah. So, let's start from the very beginning, I guess. Okay. Am I one or just Mission Impossible? Right. 1996. Uh, yeah, just not Mission Impossible. 1996. This was the introduction to the Mission Impossible series. Yeah. Uh, you had a, a team of, I mean, they don't say CIA, but it's like a semi CIA esque, but it's obviously not CIA. Um, operatives, they're on doing missions. Uh, uh, Tom Cruise's Are they character. Called IMF? The Impossible Missions Force, right? They're yeah, IMF. something like that. That's exactly yeah. right. Right. So yeah. these guys are um you, you you find out, you know, that their team is slowly killed off one by one. There's right. uh they're betrayed. They don't know by who. Right. They believe it's got to do with the a knock list, which is a non official covers list. Yep. And that's why he has to go and steal that information from the CIA so that he can pretend to sell it to the bad guy to uncover the mole in the IMF that's betrayed them. And you find out at the end of the long mission, it's great. There's some fantastic action sequences, including a, a helicopter chase inside a train tunnel. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? Also, another one of those seminal action sequences. Yes. And uh, you find out that Jim Phelps, who was the star, the character who was the star of the TV series, was actually the guy who betrayed the uh, the mission or the team for right. $10 million or whatever that number was at that time, which, I mean, in today's date and age, you know, seems kind of like a laughable amount of money, right? Huh. So Maybe. they, <laughs> it says something about your, your financial position. I, I, I have to say, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. A laughable amount in the sense that in the a movies. 10 million. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Excuse me while I pop open some Dom Perignon. Yeah. Dr. Evil. Um, Dr. Evil. <laughs> exactly. That's my point is that that's the kind of thing. So it's, um, it's, so, you know, you end with that and then, and then you thought, hey, this is, was a great Mission Impossible movie. This was, mm -hmm. you know, the dawn. This was before Hollywood was on its current franchise yeah. everything kick. The sequel right? kick. Yeah. Right. And so I thought, hey, I don't know if we're ever going to see another one again. I hope we do. But I really enjoyed it. It was fine. Lo and yeah. behold, early 2000s, you can see that Mission Impossible now has got a huge increase in budget. They've got no. uh, uh, Anthony Hopkins on the team. They've yeah. got, uh, I think, but I think this was Tandy Newton's first major role. Maybe. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, again, very long time ago. I can't remember. But so I just remember, you know, that sequence where she and Ethan Hunt are driving across uh, the mountaintops in Spain and he's trying to make her his mole into this uh, – bad guys organization blah 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 again another few great sequences there uh it's about the spread of uh virus so the, we're talking about this is mi2 right this was mission impossible 2 yeah so this is in this is in the year 2000 so yeah it's been about four years right and the mm -hmm. mission impossible was at the time i think it was pretty groundbreaking though right I mean, we thought that was a very groundbreaking film. 
They right. waited four years. They had MI2. MI2, was it a disappointment for you? It was a little bit because they dumbed it down and they went a yeah. little action heavy. I thought it was the opposite. Was it? A- I thought it was not action heavy. Do I have that? Am I misremembering that? I thought it or, was a little I, bit more on the action heavy. Do you open on him doing some rock climbing to some yeah. techno, or not techno, but like rock music, and then yeah. you see him, uh, you see him jump out of a skylight with the with the virus that samples that he's taken after he injects Tandy Newton with the virus. Uh, uh, you know, so you see a little bit of. Uh, I don't know. It just. I think the the problem I had with it was that it felt a bit dumbed down. I didn't mind the action. It yeah. just felt like they were not making the movie for an intelligent audience. They were making a movie more for an action-oriented audience. No judgment, by the way. I'm just saying yeah. that's what it felt yeah. like. I, I think I think you're a little bit right. I don't remember Mission Impossible 2 very much. I remember 1 for sure. I thought it was groundbreaking. I don't remember 2. And then It was three, directed by John Woo. It was John know, Woo. Which and means had, a lot of explosions. Exactly. Yeah. So there was explosions. Yeah. There was a scene where they, the two of them are literally fighting on while on uh, motorcycles. There yeah, were yeah, doves everywhere. That. You know what I, I mean? I remember That's the I doves. I definitely that, remember the doves. So there was a little bit of cool espionage when you know he prote- where he puts his own face mask on the bad guy and he wears the bad guy's face on his, and so he for and he kills. The bad guy ends up killing his best friend, thinking that's uh, Tom Cruise, but it's not. You know, so there was a little bit of subterfuge there, but it was, again, it just felt like a, it didn't feel like an espionage movie. It didn't feel like a spy thriller. It just felt like a good action movie. I agree. I agree. And then Mission Impossible 3 Uh, didn't come out until- Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yes. And so I think, I think because Mission Impossible 2, I think it, I think it, performed very well at the box office i think it was i think they said it was the best grossing film of 2000 but it wasn't really critically amazing then it took them another six years to hit mission impossible 3 2006 mission impossible 3 came out and this is where i felt like mission impossible finally kind of like found itself right yeah, Th- this is where I think you get a real striking. You, they did a really good, yeah. or not good, but they did a better job of balancing the espionage yes. elements of the movie. Yes, with the yes. action elements of the movie. Mm-hmm. But I think what made Mission Impossible three in particular very good was Philip Seymour Hoffman. He played oh, yeah. an extremely good yes. bad guy. Yes, extremely good. Billy Crudup as the the mole inside the IMF yep. wasn't great. It wasn't yes. fantastic. Yes. Not like I like Billy Crudup, but I think his role choices have been yes. not so hot since he was in uh, that you know the movie where he plays the rock star. Oh, I don't tell me. Oh my god, it's it's actually one of my favorite things. It starts with an A. Hold on, that's gonna bother me. I'm gonna look it up. It starts with an A where he's a rock star? Uh, yeah, he was in... Almost uh, Famous. Almost, almost Famous. F- almost Famous. That's the one. So that, for me, one of... Uh, anyway, regardless, I thought that was a good movie. But I think that Philip Seymour so, Hoffman, uh, phenomenal bad guy. Like, really yeah. good bad guy. I agree. And I mean, honestly, this, I this cast was so good, right? I mean, yeah. So, so first of all, I agree. We should add Philip Seymour Hoffman to our episode where we talk about most iconic villains, right? Right. Be- because his 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 portrayal here of uh, what was it called the Rabbit's Foot or whatever the guy's name was this was this was amazing. But mm-hmm. this is a very very good cast, right? This is the first time I think we've seen uh, Ving Rhames, Michelle Monaghan. As you mentioned, uh, Billy Crudup, Carrie you know, Russell. Ving Rhames was in uh, Mission Impossible 1. Oh, was he? He's he been in all Mission of them. Impossible 2. Yeah, yeah. I think he was in one Whoa. action. Whoa. No way. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he, he had that funny line where he getting, he's getting shot up while oh. he's in the helicopter. And he gets shot in his jacket. And he goes, oh, you son of a bitch. That was a Gucci jacket or something like no that. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I vaguely remember him doing that. 
Uh, you're right. I'm looking at his anthology. He was Luther in Mission Impossible, and he was Luther. <laughs> it's funny that they put in Mission Impossible, they just put he's Luther Stickle. In Mission Impossible 2, they say IMF agent Luther Stickle. But yeah, he was in both <laughs> yeah. of them. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, he's been in all of them. Carrie yeah. Russell, Maggie Q, Lawrence Fishburne. Wow, that MI3. But this was J.J. Abrams, right? He kind of came in and... Yeah, so and this was, I as, think, J.J. Abrams' does, directorial yeah. debut in the yeah. Mission Impossible fr- franchise. I think since yeah. then, it's been taken over by Chris McQuarrie. Yep. But in general, this is like... This is, I think, where you now see Mission Impossible entering the public zeitgeist of uh, pop culture. Yeah, yeah. I think Mission Impossible 1 was a little bit low-key. Mission Impossible 2 was like a, oh, uh, like people, I think some people dismissed it as a John Woo action movie, but I think it was Mission Impossible 3 that really put the franchise on the roadmap of most viewers' minds. Between J.J. Abrams and Christopher McQuarrie were missing Brad Bird, who did only one, which is That's MI4, right. MI4, which was, yeah. MI4 is called Rogue, Ni- uh, no, Ghost Protocol. So, okay. so it went mission, it went mission colon impossible, mission impossible two, mission impossible three, then it went mission impossible ghost protocol, right? After three, they, right. they stopped using the, the numbers. Uh, four, five, six, Ghost Protocol, Rogue Nation followed. And then I guess seven and eight or whatever to be determined. Right. So, so yeah. I think Ghost Protocol was the fourth one. Also, I excellent movie. This is where I think we see the true blend of yeah. high-level yeah. espionage <laughs> with high-level yes. action. And this right. had, yeah, this is the first time we have Simon Pegg involved, right? Uh, yeah, I don't remember him in three. He could be, yep. but I don't remember him in three. Yep. And Jeremy Renner came in kind of, I kind of felt like they were thinking of like Jeremy Renner would take over, but then Jeremy Renner just kind of like, I think he, he is removed, right? Eventually. Yeah, I think, so no, he, he appears in the other movies, but like mm-hmm. I, so they never said this explicitly and of course no yep. one would ever admit to it. But I think they secretly brought in Jeremy Renner with the hopes that if he were well liked by the audience, yeah, uh, and if he stood out, that they would potentially use Jeremy Renner as someone to supersede Tom yeah. Cruise in future installments. Yeah, right. I agree. They did that with Born Identity as well, or one of the Born movies. They tried to get Jeremy Renner as a potential Jason Bourne replacement. It didn't work. Yeah. And so, you know, he kind of gets he kind of gets uh put back in the background, you know? Yeah. Is this is Ghost Protocol? I mean, now we think of we think of all these Mission Impossibles as having at least one like amazing wow stunt, right? Is is Oh, Ghost what do you think Protoc- it was for Ghost Protocol? Ghost Protocol is climbing Burj Khalifa, right? Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. I- for me, that's the. I mean, in Mission Impossible One, we had dangling from the the ceiling, right yeah. on the rope. Two and three, I can't think of like really an iconic stunt. But then in four, five, six, every single one had something that was like wow, like yeah. just I think the whole Dubai wow, sequence right? is the the wow factor in Ghost Protocol. What happens in Rogue Nation? That's the one where... Ah, so hanging this, off the airplane. Hanging off ha- the airplane. Hanging off the airplane. So Rogue Nation, I think this is where... So the last two movies, uh, so episodes five and six, or movies five and six, yeah. I think is where you start to see Mission Impossible really take from uh, James Bond, taking a lot of direction from James Bond or homage to James Bond, because that's the one where you have a second secret cabal of bad guys. Yes. Right? Called the Syndicate. And it's very reminiscent to what happens in James Bond with uh with Christoph Waltz, right? Yep. Where he's leading another secret cabal of bad guys, Illuminati-esque bad guys that control um basically 
all of the bad things that are happening around the world in a coordinated yeah. sense, right? Yeah. So I think that's where you have Rogue Nation and Fallout, which are, you know, they, they weren't framed as direct sequels, but they're more connected than you would have thought. So is Ghost Protocol, I, I remember this is like the the bombing of the Kremlin, and it, who are the group of bad guys, or the, I don't know, the protagonist in Ghost Protocol? Uh, is it the is it the syndicate? The syndicate starts in Rogue Nation, I know. Yeah. Is it in still this, the? No. Is it so Ghost Protocol? The syndicate Ghost also Protocol, or someone else? No, no, no. In Ghost Protocol, it's that single Swedish doctor who thinks yeah. that the world's end is coming, so he wants yes. to bring it upon or do yes. whatever he wants to do by exploding a, a suitcase nuke that he steals yeah. from the Kremlin. Okay. So there's just one protagonist in Ghost Protocol. Then Rogue Nation. That's where we get the syndicate, right? That's the first yes. time we get the the idea right. of the syndicate. All right. Yes. And that goes into Fallout as well, where it's like the former members of the syndicate. Exactly. And then we get the then we get the the iconic sequence here, I think. Oh, is the, the Halo sequence. jump. Uh, oh, also well, the Yeah. The Halo jump and quite possibly also the fact that you have like a very, very jacked Henry Cavill. <laughs> yes. Mustachioed, arm, mustachioed. Mo- in November. <laughs> yeah, cocking his arms as if they were yeah. pistol, a shotgun, yeah. and then yes. fighting that guy in the bathroom. Yes. I think for me stands yeah. out as quite possibly one of the most, uh, for yeah. for me anyway, as st- one of the most standout moments in that movie. Right. Yeah, I, I think I think Cable. I think that Halo jump got a lot of publicity, and I thought it was kind of from the from the landing of the of that jump. Because remember, something happened with Henry Cabal's Yeah, he gets suit. knocked out. He yeah, gets knocked so out and then uh, yes. Tom Cruise has to save him. Yes, and then right. and then they have like the, the they land rough on the roof, and Cable's yeah, like, "Hey, and, dude, like, what's your problem?" <laughs> you know, like, exactly. No, and because like, he was knocked out, and then he went, yeah. he lands normally, and then he's like, yeah. what's, your big, "What's the big deal?" That was easy, right? <laughs> yeah, that jump, and then that fight scene. I agree. In the in the bathroom, or like the. The iconic parts of, of Fallout that I remember. Yeah, or at least the, maybe, and if not iconic, at least very memorable, right? Yeah. I also remember, you know, there's there's a scene that's not intended to be memorable, but, you know, it's it's the scene where Tom Cruise is, like, running and he jumps across from one building roof, oh my rooftop God, yes. to another. That's and, right. and that's where he that's where he broke his leg. And that wasn't probably supposed to be memorable at all it's just another tom cruise yeah, running jumping so scene that but it was, became memorable because yes. we all knew that he actually broke yeah. his leg in real yeah. life yeah that was in yeah. the last movie in fallout 7 yeah. oh my uh, sorry in mission impossible 7 that's right yeah oh my god i you know i still cringe when i think of that right like when i see that cuz yeah. we both know we all know that he yeah. that he actually snaps his ankle there yeah. so you know you can't help but feel like oh god you know I mean, I think there's a few super cool takeaways from that. One, Tom Cruise, I mean, he's not doing all his own stunts, of course, but like, that's a pretty serious stunt that he probably didn't have to do. They could have got like a stand in for that. He was doing it himself. He hit the wall hard. Like yeah. anyone who watched it was like, whoa, like he hit it hard. And then I think the story goes that he still did like one or two more takes after that. Yeah, he walked it off and then he tried again <laughs> apparently and then you're just like how do you how do you walk off Man. a broken ankle? You know, I yeah. mean, look, maybe I'm getting old but I am not as old as Tom Cruise, but I can yeah. tell you right now if I sneeze wrong, yeah. my back is out for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. I have to say Tom Cruise, I mean, he's got his own reputation in life he's gone through his his own you know public stuff but i mean when it comes to his films yeah no one I don't can think, take that away from him i don't think anyone can argue that he does not give a hundred percent you know when he's on set I, I i really don't think anyone could argue that with a straight face he's yeah. all in all the time when it comes to yeah. and he, you, you know, know he's just character. reinforced that while filming seven and eight because remember that yeah. it came out that like he had a public meltdown on the set because yeah. people weren't being coronavirus safe, they yeah. weren't distancing, and like he flipped out, and like it was, it was on the same scale of yeah. notoriety as when Christian Bale went off on the sound operator in Terminator. 
What did he say to the sound operator? Uh, apparently, like he, cr- this guy who was uh, there was some sound engineer or something crossed yeah. the set <clears throat> while they were shooting, but he was unbeknownst to him that they were shooting, mm. and he goes off on her. I mean, Christian oh, really? loses his mind. If you hear the video, it's like it's actually shocking at how much he loses his marbles at this one guy. He was just like, man, you're an idiot. What are you doing? Get uh, off the yeah. set. And, and not just that, but mocking him. Like, he mocks mm. him. Like, he goes off. To, he goes on a rant with him. And Tom Cruise does the same thing. But because he's not doing it for a filming-related thing, he's doing it because, yeah. you know, these guys are breaching COVID protocol kind of thing. Yeah. It like it gives him Mission a level impossible of, COVID protocol. Yeah, right. It gives him a little bit more um, yeah. intensity. It, it reaffirms his intensity, but intensity for the so-called yeah. right thing, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like it's not I, him I, being a jerk yeah. for the sake of because a take was ruined. It's him being yeah. a jerk because these guys are potentially endangering everyone. Yeah, I, I, the way I heard it was. I mean, it's it's hard to say like what the what the reality was, but the way I heard it positioned was the same, which is he was saying, "Look, you guys have to." I mean, I'm paraphrasing without uh, f bombs, of course, but he was he's basically saying, "Look, you've got to take this seriously. If there's any violations, this will be shut down. We can't be shut down, you know. Yeah. So you've got to like follow the rules exactly." Yeah. Um, so I agree with you. It it, it seemed like a an overall like public safety message not a hey you're an idiot you know don't make mistakes kind of message you know yeah yeah oh man i gotta find that christian bale dressing down i really oh want to hear God. that I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link i'm sure i have no it so can we we listen. should we should play it we should play it like during an episode because <laughs> <laughs> i bet a lot of other people want to hear it as well i i definitely do if you can find it for the next one We'll put it on a, on a uh, yeah, meltdown. Yeah. Well, that's how we'll open the next one. <laughs> Christian Bale berating the living hell out of this one poor guy. No, whenever whenever you or I make a mistake, yeah, and we don't have like our, our microphone set up or something, right? Then we'll just yeah. play that towards the other person. <laughs> fine, fine, fine. So yeah, it's um. Anyway, so that was. Sorry, so six and seven are direct sequels of each other. They, or at least they didn't seem to be at first, but they really are. They relate to each other. In six, you have Tom Cruise taking down the so-called syndicate. Yeah. The syndicate was a rogue government organization that was created to do things without any governmental oversight. And it's about how they're trying to steal two and a half billion pounds um, oh. to fund their operations, right? And then you have, yeah. Now we're talking real money, right? I Compared honestly, to ten million dollars in <laughs> Mission Impossible. I honestly, I honestly don't remember at all the plot of Fallout. Not okay. at all. Okay. And then in Fallout is the one where you find out that the syndicates, uh, the so the syndicate itself has kind of been broken up by Tom Cruise in yeah. uh, Fallout. Or in whatever the Rogue Nation. Movie in Rogue movie. Nation. Yeah. Uh, sorry, in Rogue Nation. Yeah, maybe I'm mm-hmm. confusing the names, but okay, let's put it this way. In six, uh, sorry, in ep- in series five, Tom Cruise is the, breaks up that um, organization. In yep. movie six, the members of that organization have now come back and created a sub organization oh, to still yeah. try to carry out that mission. And. <laughs> Unbeknownst to us, one of those members is uh, Henry Cavill, yeah, who is in that role. Uh, who has yes. now planted himself in the CIA as yes. a double agent, and yes. of course that culminates in that final uh, uh, yeah. battle between the two of them. Which was actually that probably one of the more iconic sequences of that movie as well is when they're having that um, standoff fist fight on the edge of a cliff. With the helicopter dangling underneath them, and yeah. you know Tom Cruise uses the weight of the helicopter to basically yep. slam Cavill's face in, or whatever yeah. it is, you know, something like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's. Uh, Can I ask you a question? Do you remember yeah. in Rogue Nation, which is five? Yep. Yeah. There was we we remember the scene where that plane took off, that cargo plane took off, 
and Tom Cruise was, was hanging out off the side of it. There was also an underwater scene, remember, where he had to hold his breath and go underwater and disable yes. something. The The lore is that Tom Cruise held his breath for six minutes. Is that is true? This, I don't I was going to ask you. <laughs> I can believe you saying that because I remember there was that. So if you remember uh, Minority Report. Yeah. Right. There was that sequence in that movie where he's hiding from the Sentinel drones that are looking for him. Yeah. And he has just gotten his eyes transplanted. Yes. And to yes. minimize his body heat, he jumps into a tub of a bathtub filled yes. with ice water. Yes. And he ho- holds his face submerged underneath, right? His head yes. submerged. I remember that. I that when that came out, so what alerts the drones that there's someone in there is that you see in the movie an air bubble comes out of his nostril. Oh, right, right, right. Yes. And apparently Tom Cruise did that himself. That wasn't CGI. He actually waited in the bathtub for however many minutes that was, and he forced himself to be able to Ex- exhaled that one small tiny air bubble and i don't know how he did it but he did that so i can if you're telling me that he had to be in a water in a swimming pool for six minutes even though Is it seems possible? impossible even though it seems impossible i believe it i mean how long can a human hold their breath like without uh, brain damage i thought it was i, I, don't I know. thought I thought the I thought the unofficial rule. Oh my god, we need a doctor on the show. I thought the unofficial rule was three, three, three. That you can go three minutes without breathing, three days without water, three days without food. That's no not three right. weeks without food. <laughs> three weeks without food. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I thought the rule was three, three, three. Uh yeah, but then when it comes to Tom Cruise, Six it becomes minutes? it becomes thirty three, thirty three, thirty three. He can hold his breath for six minutes. I don't know. I feel like that's that's embellished Hollywood. Yeah, six you know, minutes. Who is he? Chris Angel? That's crazy to me. You know, it could also be one of those urban myths, yeah, urban legends. I think so as well. Yeah. That also that he's that he's. Yeah, and in fairness to him, he's done all these things that. Uh, well, the kind amount of, of respect, that, right? Yeah, the amount of respect. You're, you're right. I think we're saying the same thing, which is the amount of respect we have for him is so high that when we hear something that we think is actually impossible, we still kind of like pause and say, "Maybe he did, or did yeah. he do it?" You know, like it's it's not dismissed. If I would tell you, like, "Hey," I can hold my breath for six minutes. You're like, no way. Maybe, maybe you can do it for sixty seconds. No way you can do it for six minutes. Right? You you just dismiss it like immediately. When when it's Tom Cruise, we're kinda like, well no, the guy is kinda like a a psychopath. You know, maybe maybe he did practice it. Maybe he can do it for six minutes. Yeah. But for yeah, me that I, seems like Chris Angel kinda like yeah, it seems stuff. David Copperfield in the sense yeah. that, you know, he's clearly got to have an oxygen tank in there. But then yeah. he's, you know, but then you also know he walked off a broken foot, right? Or a broken ankle, right? So yeah. when you look at that kind of intensity and dedication, you can't help but think, a part of you at least is like, <laughs> you know what? I believe it. Yeah. Uh, maybe he actually is a vampire and he turned himself into a vampire for interview with a vampire because he's crazy enough that he would do that. He is crazy enough that he would do that. So in, I, in the very best sense of the word, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, I don't. I don't say these things speciously. I don't say it as an insult. I say it as, in a way, honoring him by saying, "Hey, yeah. this guy is so dedicated to the craft, for good or for bad. If there's something the human body can do, he will figure it out to get it done. If he can't do it himself, you know." Uh, I saw a late night show where I can't remember who it was. An actor was talking to Tom Cruise, right? Yeah. And he was telling him about how Tom Cruise was was doing all these stunts. And apparently there was a stunt that Tom Cruise wanted to do for one of the Mission Impossibles. And the safety guy said, no way. You can't do that. We can't do that. So Tom Cruise 
fired him and hired another safety guy who would say yes. <laughs> it's like it's like uh like an investment bank firing the compliance officer, yeah? <laughs> that's exactly it. That's exactly what happened. Is I'll just keep firing you until I find someone who's dumb and uh, who's smart enough to say yes to me. Like Michael Jackson's uh physician. Yeah. Prescri- Prescribe this. No. Well, then you're not my pres- my physician anymore. And yeah, I'll keep interviewing someone until I find someone that's going to say yes, right? Exactly. And eventually so someone will. <laughs> it's, um, it's, you know, it's mind boggling, but that's Tom Cruise for you, right? Mm-hmm. That's the, you know, I know in one of the previous episodes we talked about villains that we need to talk about. But like Tom Cruise in Collateral, oh, the yeah. reason he was so menacing was because you... Us as people, as regular viewers, know Tom Cruise is a likable, highly charismatic guy. But so we also believe and we know that he does yeah. everything that he does. So when he shows up as a bad guy, you can't help but feel like, oh my God, he could actually do that. Like if he decided tomorrow, hey, I want to quit Hollywood and become a contract killer, he could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying he should do that. Tom Cruise, if you're listening to this, Please do not and be I a think, contract. I mean, killer. we want to see technically you in more he may. I mean, movies. he may be good at that, but I think his face is a little bit too recognizable to actually get away with it. You, you should probably be a little bit more anonymous if you're going to go into that line of work, right? All right. I mean, he he did color his hair silver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what's happening with Seven? When is it coming out? It's still Skydance, Bad Robot, Christopher McQuarrie. Uh, when? Tell me when Simon so, Pegg's in it, Bing Rames is in it. All the same, all the same folks that we want to see. When is this happening? Yeah. So look, officially, the movie is in what the what Hollywood calls as post production, which is to say it's done, but they're you know yeah. they don't know when they're going to release it or not release it, whatever it is. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what Wikipedia says. Okay, tell me. For better or for worse, Wikipedia says Mission Impossible 7 is scheduled to be released on July 14th. 2023? 2023. Yeah. It was what previ- And then it says, sadly, it should have a sad em- emoji here. It was previously set to be released on July 23, 2021. November 19, 2021. May 27, 2022. Yeah. September 30, <laughs> 2022. Before yeah. being delayed and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It's a shame. It's a real shame because I, I have high expectations <laughs> and high hopes for it. Or not expectation, but high hopes for it. Yeah. So I, I am looking forward to it. Um, but that means that Mission Impossible 8 won't be until 2024. I mean, yeah, that's so... Let me tell you what Wikipedia says. <laughs> this film is currently scheduled to be released on June 28, 2024. Yeah. That's too late. No, cannot- so it's not too late. I I, I, I would, I, I'll argue with you on that. I think that it's not too late given where Mission Impossible 7 comes because you don't want to see 7 and 8 back to back, right? Really? Yeah, I look, all for me movies, all movies, not just the Mission Impossible series are like a little bit like uh, a fine wine, right? Is that you want to let it breathe a bit. You want to give it a bit of space. If you overwhelm too many of them in too short a time, you risk diluting the val- uh, you risk diluting the movie's impact, right? And I as much as I love seeing superhero movies all the time, I would say this is one of the easiest things you could ding the Marvel Cinematic Universe for is releasing three or four movies every year for 10 years in a row or for however many years in a row has significantly downplayed the value of each of those movies because you're no longer excited for that movie a month after it's come out because you're already looking forward to the next one, right? So I'm really... uh, But I I guess, I mean, I don't have a calendar in front of me, so I I can't say why this doesn't make sense. But given that this movie should have been ready in 2021, why aren't they showing it at the end of 2022? And then have the other, I mean, I'm I'm still not clear why they're waiting until mid-2023. 
That seems like a really long delay to me. So that you hit the summer, right? You hit the yeah. uh, you hit well, the summer do, stride. Why not do winter? Why not do that Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's? You know, December twenty twenty two. Say shave six months. Yeah, I think I think also Top Gun is is jamming things up as well because as you said, okay, you can't have too much of a good thing, but you also can't have probably too much Tom Cruise. And if he's going to be doing Top Gun 2, which I think is coming out now. This summer? Wikipedia says May 2022. Yeah. So that means three years in a row, he's got a blockbuster coming out kind of in summer. Yeah, May, which June, is June. which is great because it maximizes the box office potential for that movie, yeah. right? You don't want to have Mission yeah. Impossible. You don't want a Tom Cruise movie interrupting with another Tom Cruise movie. Right. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of, uh, in terms of blockbusters coming out in the winter, remember, although it's been confirmed as delayed now, you were looking at, at that time, Aquaman, you were looking at, uh, The Flash, and you were looking at Black Panther 2 coming out all around that same time of end of 2022. You don't want to be Mission Impossible. I love the Mission Impossible franchise, but between those four movies that I just mentioned, Mission Impossible Four is going to be the one that uh, Mission Impossible is going to be the one that suffers the most Do because think, most. Really? I I strongly can you say that believe. Again? Can you say Can you say that again? Among what films do you think suffers the most? Can you list them out again? Yeah. So I think that if you look at the end of 2022, right? Yeah. And assuming that the releases held. If you okay. have Black Panther 2, if you have Aquaman 2, and you have The Flash, and everyone knows in The Flash all the Batman are coming back into it, oh. I think, at least oh, def- no. at least in America, I think that Mission <laughs> Impossible 4 comes down as the loser out of those four movies in December. I don't know, Pete. I, I, that's, that, I don't know if that's a hot take, but I have to say, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm I, just I would, thinking in terms of box office over the last yeah. five to ten years, the biggest winners have all been superhero movies. All of them. Nah. And I don't think a Mission Impossible movie is going to be able to beat Black Panther 2 in the cinema. I just don't. Black Panther 1 made a billion dollars, almost half of that, in the first two or three weeks. There's no way Mission Impossible is a billion dollar movie. I love those franchises, but the Mission Impossible franchise is not a billion dollar movie franchise. So you think, so are we now looking at the end of 22 and we're going to have Black Panther 2, we're going to have Flash, and we're going to have Aquaman 2? No, that because can't, so that Flash, can't make sense. They've got, they've got Flash and Flash. Aquaman, no, Flash yeah. and Aquaman both have been delayed. I don't know okay. when to, uh, but I, I did see that Jason Momoa tweeted it out that I think Aquaman 2 is 23 now. And yeah. I think... The Flash has taken Aquaman's position in the cinema, which means that it'll come down to like Black Panther versus um, Flash. And if that's the case, I definitely still expect Black Panther to win. Really? Yeah. It's Why? Just, the first one was such a cultural phenomenon. Such a cultural phenomenon. And I think on top of that, now you're going to have a mystery as to seeing what they do with, uh, you know, unfortunately, Chadwick Boseman has passed away. Yeah. So how do they move on from that? And then you have the, first of all, you have the Marvel effect. Second of all, you have the cultural effect because Black Panther really was the first African American slash black slash African, whatever you want to deem it, ethnically, uh, impactful movie in the superhero uh, environment for Marvel, right? If you think, so I think in terms of yeah. culture, the cultural impact I think is for Black Panther is far more significant than any of the other superhero movies that we've seen in the recent years. So I think that's why for me particular, I, I just think that, You know, people are going to go to the cinema for Black Panther 2 in the droves. And and by the way, even if you discount all of that, Black Panther 1 was just an excellent movie. It was an excellent movie. Ryan Coogler knows how to make excellent movies. So I fully expect Black Panther to be uh, Black Panther 2 to be equally good, if not better. 
Hmm. So what is what is Top Gun coming up against in May? Do you have any idea? Uh, in the summer, what are the big ones? Let's see. I'm looking it up now. Uh, it's not. It's not clear. I mean, I, I think. I think even right now, after we've got Batman, which we reviewed, please check it out. Uh, we're in a little bit of a lull. There is the contractor with Chris Pine, who we haven't seen in ages. Mm. Um. You've got okay. So in terms of summer blockbuster potential movies, you've got the Minions yeah. too, right? Which I mean, I know it's an animated kids movie, but it's still a very successful franchise. I'm I'm in. By the way, All I right. just want to say if we're uh, we, listeners, we are going to be reviewing Minions too. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're forgetting we have Jurassic World three. Uh, I'm not in. Right? What else? No, we may not be in, but these are still national. I mean, these are blockbuster type movies, right? I agree. You have uh, the prequel to Toy Story with Lightyear. Mm. You've got what else coming out? Let me see. In terms of things that I think are going to be really massive successes, theoretically, I don't know if it's going to be I because I, I don't know the impact because I don't watch the show. Downton Abbey's releasing its uh, another movie. What? Downton yeah. Abbey's having a movie? I think it's their second one. I think they've already released a movie. I do watch Downton Abbey. Uh, I haven't seen it. I have watched... Wow, I feel like it's just, like extremely old. But I feel like I've seen like a few episodes, but like it, it's not my style. Although, I have to say, if I, if I, I bet if I watched a season, I'd be totally hooked. But just like after the first like episode or two, like it, those period pieces are not my style. Yeah, period pieces aren't my, I'm, and they're great. I'm uh, really no. a showcase of excellent acting, but not my, you know, not my thing. <laughs> a but, showcase, a oh, showcase. <laughs> uh, Thor, Thor three is this summer. Oh yeah. You know, so you've got movies yeah. which are you. I'm not saying it's a stacked summer, but you've got a reasonable amount of competition, which is why I think Top Gun 2 needs to sneak in there at the start to, you know, just before summer is about to start so that it can kind of sneak the crown away from anyone else early. Because I think I fully expect, you know, out of all of these movies, I think Thor is probably going to be the smash hit because you now also have um, Natalie Portman coming back. So you'll get a lot more people interested in that again. Uh, and of course, Thor, Thor three was a big, you know, Thor, f- sorry, Thor three was a big hit. Thor Ragnarok, 4, I think, was amazing. Even better. Maybe one of my favorite. Yeah. You know. But you know, you know, Pete, there's something that that you're 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 pointing out to me, and I think you're doing it in a delicate way, which I appreciate. Um, your bedside manner. I think that Top Gun is a blockbuster because I remember. 1985, when I was a kid, yeah. going to the cinema and seeing Top Gun, and it was wow to me. Yeah. Now, yeah. Top Gun probably isn't the same. And even though I'm excited, there's probably not a lot of people who aren't really our generation who yeah. are that excited about it, you know? I, I mean, first of all, I don't think probably any women are that excited about it. You know, there was a love story and Tom Cruise was much younger. That's probably faded. And anyone who's like younger than our generation probably isn't that excited about the movie anymore. I mean, maybe they see the trailer and they get excited, but it, for me, it's like, wow, I've been waiting for this for 30 years is so exciting or 25 years. It's it doesn't probably have the same appeal to a lot of other pieces. So what does not what what I perceive as a huge summer blockbuster isn't the same for a lot of other people. And yeah, and I, I Min- think so. Minions two or Toy Story may actually be a, a bigger box box office hit. You know. Yeah, I, I think it's also so. Look, I think we have to separate two things, right? I think one, yeah. we have to think of the traditional blockbuster in terms of movies that we grew up watching. Yeah. And then also the, the, the second aspect of it is the actual financial take. Mm. So while you and I will be there in our flight suits, watching Top Gun two, 
with bags of popcorn and cheering on every scene. That's 100% correct. I am wearing a flight suit, by the way. Right. So while that's definitely true, I still anticipate that right now in the current climate, you know, the last 10 years or so, really the summers have been dominated by superhero movies. Yeah. Right. So I, that's why I think that in term, and I, again, I'm not giving this a qualitative, um, uh, justification. I'm purely talking about the quantitative financial results. So I think that th- out of this list, for example, in the summer, I think Thor has the best chance of being the summer uh, winner, in, yeah. the quote unquote winner of the box office dollars. That's not to say that, you know, Top Gun 2 isn't going to make hundreds of millions of dollars, but I think that, you know, what the if it was? What if it was Thor? What if it was Thor versus uh, Mission Impossible? What's the bigger franchise? Still Thor. Still Thor. Still mm-hmm. Thor, for sure. Uh, I again, no comparison because the super, the superhero genre as a whole has raised more billion dollar movies in the last decade, or at least. If not a billion dollars, at least half a billion dollar movies than any other franchise or any what other are, genre. Can we see the takes? Do you have any information on the takes of the uh, Mission Impossible movies? Like, what was the last Mission Impossible? Mission Impossible films box office. What do you, What do you think they are? Half a billion? Three hundred million? What do you think they are? Uh, all right. Look, I can tell you right now. So, Mission Impossible one. Yeah. Took a worldwide box office of four hundred and fifty-eight million dollars. These not are not bad. inflation adjusted. Not inflation yeah, not adjusted. not a bad amount for that that day. Right. right? Very yeah. good for Mission Impossible yes. in nineteen ninety-six. Yes. Okay, yes. on a budget of eighty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mission Impossible Two made five hundred and fifty million dollars. Whoa. Okay. Mission Impossible Three huge drop made four hundred million dollars. Hmm. Mission Impossible 4 made 600 and uh sorry 700 million dollars. Wow, that's huge. That's 4. So 694, right? That's number uh, f- that's that's Mission Impossible 4. That's 4. Mission that's Impossible Ghost, That's Ghost Protocol, right? Uh Ghost Protocol, yeah. Okay. Rogue Nation yeah. made slightly less at 690 million. Mm-hmm. And then the last one Fallout made the most so far at 790 million dollars. All right, here's here's a good trivia question. Has Tom Cruise ever had a billion dollar movie? It sounds like the answer is no. Let's do a little searching. It sounds uh, like Let's see. Let's uh let's let's do a little bit of searching here. Uh, so Tom Cruise as an yeah. Okay, so this is only giving a cumulative, unfortunately. But Tom okay. Over 39 movies. Yeah, but what has made more than... What has made more than that 700 million? Uh, okay, so... Le- okay, here we go, here we go. Uh, Mission Impossible, let's sort by size. Yeah, Mission Impossible is the most... In fact, all yeah. of the Mission Impossibles are there. War of the Worlds, interestingly enough, made $607 million. <laughs> beating it out. Last Samurai made four hundred and fifty million dollars, but then the rest of it—it's oh. almost all exclusively Mission Impossible is the top, and the most that the Mission Impossible movies made was seven hundred and ninety million dollars, right? Wow. I mean, but I get—I wonder—is if is there a list of billion-dollar movies? How many billion-dollar movies are there? All right, let's look at the records. I'm gonna. Can I guess? Can I guess before we say it? I'm gonna guess there's twelve. Billion dollar movies? Yes. You're going to say 12, eh? I mean, are we doing... I'm, I'm going to say that's a billion, not inflation adjusted. Like, Yeah, actual, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, there are 48 movies. No way. 48 yeah. movies have made a billion? Yeah. Yeah. Get this. And get this. One, two, three, four, five of them have made two. I mean, th- that should not diminish the Tom Cruise career, which is... Which is amazing by by almost any measure. But yeah, of course. I'm sure it's it's got to be something that he's cognizant of. Which is, I've been in so many movies. 
I've been amazing at everything. How is it possible I don't have a billion dollar movie, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'll get off my Tom Cruise soapbox, but I have to say, I'm super excited for Top Gun, I'm super excited for Mission Impossible, and I'm happy that I understand a little bit more, or have refreshed myself about the history of the Mission Impossibles, because after so long, I was just fuzzy about it, and I have to say, this is this is a risk. I mean, we've seen it, we just talked about Avatar. You and I have done how many episodes of films and stuff? We've never mentioned Avatar at all, have we? Like it's it's not even on our our radar, is it? Yeah, and I think no, that's, it, that's I agree. Yeah, that that's a risk when you don't make a movie for several years. Is that the franchise just kind of like you, you lose the enthusiasm? And I take your point about look, you don't want to like bunch all these Mission Impossible's together. It's going to diminish the brand value of the franchise. Okay, that's probably true. There's there's an amount of fatigue you can have, but I have to say you've also got to be careful not to spread them out too long, like. Look what's happened to Top Gun. Top Gun 2 comes out three years after the original. It's a billion-dollar movie. It comes out now, and their Paramount is afraid of when to place it because they think it's going to get trashed by all these other people that didn't even exist when the first one came out, right? Uh, So, Pete, I think we've covered all things Tom Cruise today, especially uh, especially Mission Impossible. And, and we bled into some of the other stuff, which is good to kind of get a sense of what's coming up right now. So we need to kind of focus on what's next and what are we going to watch in the interim until some of these blockbusters come out this summer, right? I know that in a couple weeks from now, we're going to start seeing the episodes of Moon Knight come out. Oh, yeah. I'm excited for that. I'm all in for that. And then shortly thereafter... Uh, Ewan McGregor is returning as Obi Wan. Obi Wan, the trailer which just came out a, few, a week ago. Yeah, actually, I have not watched the Obi Wan trailer intentionally because I really want to go into this without any expectations. I mean, my okay. expectation is that I'm so excited. It's on Disney. I kind of assume it's going to be good. I mean, I've seen you know Mandalorian. I've seen. You know, House of Boba. I I assume it's going to be quite good. And I'm going to watch it, whether I see the trailer or not. So I really don't want the trailer because I just want to turn it on the first time and have that surprise. Like, ah, you know, that's the exciting one where I need draw the shades, turn off the lights, get my popcorn, you know, get my little TV tray of everything organized just right, turn off my mobile, make sure there's no distractions and I'm just in a relaxed mood. And and I just want to, like, turn it on and just be wowed. I don't want to be like, oh, he looks pretty good, or that's not yeah. what I thought he'd look like, or that yeah. looks cool. I can't wait to see if that's in the opening scene or at the end, or I just want it to be surprise all the yeah. way through. I, I will just say, no spoiler at all, I will just say I'm very excited for it, based on the trailer. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So that's that's in advance. That's a subscribe. Or I'm just going to say I'm already giving it a subscribe. That I would already I already have uh, Disney Plus. But if I didn't, I would already subscribe to Disney Plus there you to go. watch Obi Wan. I'm I'm that excited about it. So okay, Pete. Pleasure as always. I appreciate your time and thanks for all your insights. All right. Thank you so much, Ethan. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you for listening to another episode of Films and Stuff. If you haven't already, please subscribe and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are downloaded. Films and Stuff. There is no substitute.